end of the screen. I'm Dorothy Skye, the president of the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin, and it is my delight to welcome you to the fourth of our sessions, our webinars on the national popular vote. Hopefully you were able to tune into the others, but if you weren't, we'll show you how to get to those recordings at the end of the presentation. The League of Women Voters of Wisconsin is a proud partner in the hard work of ensuring that our president, our US president is indeed the person who receives the greatest number of votes cast by all voters. Tonight, in this concluding session, we will concentrate on the action steps we can make to help the national popular vote be a reality. Getting it done in Wisconsin, in other words. We'll be joined tonight by league members and by two state senator, senators who will help us understand how our collective actions can influence the legislative process and pass the national popular vote interstate compact. That's the quickest, best mechanism to get this done. Before we go to that important discussion, let's take a few minutes to understand the league's role, both at the state level and nationally. Um, and our um, leader of the State League NPVIC Working Group, Barb Padrick, will give us that. Barb, it's your turn. Oh, I should say, yeah, Barb started this work while a member of the Greater Green Bay League. And though she has moved to Oak Park, Illinois, she has remained dedicated to this work. And we are delighted to have her continuance. So Barb. Thanks, Dorothy. Hi, everybody. As Dorothy said, I'm Barb Patrick. Um, I am, uh, I guess, the leader of our League of Women Voters Wisconsin Working Group for National Popular Vote. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the League's position on electing the president and on the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Um, and we're how we get to today and um, just give you a little send off. Um, so in 2010, the League of Women Voters of the United States added the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact as one acceptable way to, uh, to achieve our long standing goal of electing the president um, by direct popular vote. And of course, it's the president and the vice president of the United States. Um, so here we have our position on the screen. And it says the League of Women Voters of the United States believes that the direct popular vote method for electing the president and vice president is essential to representative government. The League of Women Voters believes, therefore, that the Electoral College should be abolished. We support the use of the National Popular Vote Compact as one acceptable way to achieve the goal of the direct popular vote for election of the president until the abolition of the Electoral College is accomplished. Then in 2016, the National League launched a program called Making Democracy Work. It's an important league-wide campaign. And the intent of this campaign is to engage leagues across, excuse me, engage leagues across the country. Um, and and to, the purpose is to advance core democracy issues. There, there were four general um, topics, voting rights, improving elections, campaign finance slash money and politics, and redistricting. Then, in 2018, at the National Convention, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact was added to this Making Democracy Work campaign. And in 2020, at the 2020 Convention, we reaffirmed that position. A national task force for National Popular Vote was created, and a web page devoted to the National Popular Vote um, was established on the U.S. League's website. But this year, some of the national popular vote supporters around the country noticed what we felt was a problem. 
national popular vote was kind of a ghost. Although a national task force had been created and there was the website, national popular vote wasn't specifically listed on that website. You couldn't find it. So some in the national leadership thought that it didn't need to be specifically listed because it was encompassed in improving elections, the overall topic of improving elections. But many of us national popular vote advocates believe that the importance of electing the president by popular vote is so grave that it should not be swept into the general category of other general important, very important election issues, uh, such as voter ID and ballot, um, ballot uh, drop boxes and some of the very important election, I would say process um, topics that are forefront right now. They're so important, but we also, we felt that especially at this time, when our democracy appears to be at risk, that we must specifically stand up for more, for no more second place presidents. That the candidate who wins should be the candidate who wins the majority of the nationwide votes. So we strongly felt that specific language must be included in the Making Democracy Work campaign so that leagues, leagues members and the public would see that the direct election of the president is of such utmost importance that it's listed, it's specifically listed as a focus of our organization. And I think Molly went to the second slide. Oh, back one more, Matt, Molly, back to the, oh, that was my timer, but I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, so let's, so yes, here we go. Um, so what happened at the, uh, the 2022 convention, which was in June in Denver, is that a motion was made by the League of Women Voters of Palm Beach County, Florida. And that motion was to amend the 2022 to 24 Making Democracy Work campaign, the proposed campaign that was being presented at the convention to elevate the direct election of the president by popular vote as a prominent listed component of making democracy work. This motion specifically included both the national popular vote interstate compact and the abolition of the electoral college by constitutional amendment. Guess what? That, emotion, that motion passed by 794 to 81. It was hugely supported. All, look, over 800 people, almost 900 people who were delegates to the convention voted for that. So now the direct election of the president by popular vote will be a distinct fifth listed topic in, a making, in the Making Our Democracy Work campaign. Um, national popular vote is the quick start. It's the pathway, the quick start pathway to achieving our goal. It's possible that enough states will pass it to become law by 2024, but more than likely it would be by 2028, but only if we work for it. So next slide, please. So what has our Wisconsin League been doing? Okay, our league formed a statewide working group in 2019, and we've been working hard to educate ourselves, league members throughout the state and the public. We've held at least 18 live and virtual presentations and we've reached over 1,200 people so far. Today, you will hear some steps that you can take toward getting the national popular vote passed in Wisconsin. These include joining our working group, which tells how you can work statewide to keep working to educate and get this bill passed. We need you and we want you. So please, at the end, you'll be told how to contact us. You can always call the state office or email them too and join our working group. Or you can take up the oar and work locally with your local leagues and your community. We have a toolkit on our state league website that will give you uh, slide presentations, quizzes you can give people. And you'll have a quiz at the end of today, I believe. Um, and it'll give you uh, resources and information for yourself to educate yourself. And you can also go to the nationalpopularvote.com website. That's the website for the national advocacy. It's a nonprofit group that has been working for national popular vote since 2007. 
So now I'm going to turn it over to either Dorothy or Deborah Crabmiller, who is our executive director, who is going to be moderating, has joined us. I don't know. She's having computer problems. But either Dorothy or Deborah will now take it to give you some important information about the mindset of Americans on electing the president by popular vote. Dorothy, or I guess it's you. I don't think. Good evening, everyone. I don't know if you can hear me. We got gotcha. you. Deborah's back. Oh, Welcome, excellent. Deborah. <laughs> excellent. Thank you. This has been a nightmare. Um, I want to begin with my own welcome. Thanks, everyone. But let's turn our attention to some other facts in addition to those that Barb just shared with us. 63% of all voters support electing the person who gets the most votes. If you want to advance the slide, Molly. And that includes 42% of declared Republicans are folks leaning Republican, and 80% of Democrats are those leaning Democratic. So it's, it is a majority, and we need to act on that majority together to get this done in Wisconsin. Let's take a little moment now to level set. Greater Green Bay League member Jill Fermanich got interested in this important topic a couple of years after she attended a forum like this one. Um, Jill will take a few minutes now to give us a bit more information about the national popular vote. This is critical information for those who might be new to these conversations, but it's an excellent um, refresher for those who have been participating in these throughout our series. Jill? Okay. Thanks, Deborah. Um, as Deborah said, my name is Jill Fermanick, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Greater Green Bay. And I'm just going to give a little refresher, put things in context. So, um, yeah, we Americans elect all officials from mayors to U.S. senators by popular vote, except for two, the president and vice president of the United States. When you and I vote for these two offices every four years in November, we are actually voting for electors who will then cast their votes for president and vice president in the following month of December. And this group of electors is what we refer to as the Electoral College. The whole Electoral College process was laid out in the Constitution. Article 2, Section 1 says that each state legislature shall appoint a number of electors equal to the number of senators and representatives to which that state is entitled. It also says that the state legislature shall decide how to appoint those state's electors, which method they will use to choose electors. So we use the electoral college process to elect president and vice president. In elections for these two offices, every vote should be equal, Every voter in every state should be politically relevant, and the candidate who wins the most popular votes in the entire country should win the presidency. However, this is not always the case because 48 states currently use the winner-take-all rule of selecting their electors. Remember that each state has the power to choose how they select their electors. <clears throat> So states using the winner-take-all rule award all of their state's electoral votes to the candidate who wins the popular vote within that particular state and not to the candidate who wins the most votes in the nation as a whole. So those voters who vote for their state's second place candidate essentially have their votes discarded. The statewide winner-take-all rule makes it possible for the candidate to win the presidency without winning the most popular votes nationwide. And as you can see here on the slide, in fact, five of our 46 presidents have lost the popular vote but won the Electoral College, including in 2000 and 2016. And because we are currently in an era of very close elections, this almost happened in 2004 and 2020 also. So we've had two near misses and two wrong winners in six election cycles. <clears throat> And as we learned in our previous webinars, a solution to this problem is the direct election of the president through the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. And um, as Barb said, the League of Women Voters, along with many other organizations and citizens, supports the direct election of the president by popular vote, including the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Uh, and the compact is an agreement between the states that each state will award all of their electoral votes to whichever presidential candidate wins the overall popular vote nationwide. So the compact would not abolish the electoral college. Um, 
And as I said earlier, that because the electoral college process is part of the original design of the US Constitution, it would be necessary to pass a constitutional amendment to change this system. And you may remember that an amendment needs to pass two thirds of each house and then be ratified by three quarters of all the states in order for um, an, an amendment to occur. And um, that's not likely to happen in the foreseeable future. So even though the compact won't abolish the electoral college, it will still guarantee that the winner of the electoral college vote and the popular vote are the same. So the compact ensures that every vote in every state will matter in every presidential election. So why don't you put up the next slide, <clears throat> Molly, please. The, so the compact will go into effect when states representing at least 270 electoral college votes adopt the legislation. Um, and why is it 270? Because each state gets a number of electors equal to the number of its members of Congress, senators and representatives. Um, so for example, Wisconsin has 10 electoral votes. We've got eight representatives and two senators. So including the District of Columbia's three electors, there are currently 538 electors. Therefore, 270 represents the number of electoral votes necessary to win a majority of the Electoral College. And currently 15 states in the District of Columbia have adopted legislation to join the compact and together they represent 195 electoral votes. And I think there's a list of the states on the next slide, Molly. Thanks. So the bill will take effect when it's enacted by states with 75 additional electoral votes. And these are the states that have already adopted it, states and District of Columbia. So today we're gonna to talk about how we can add Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes to that number. And with that, I'll hand it back to Deborah. Thank you, Jill, for that wonderful background. Um, it is now my pleasure to introduce two of our legislative leaders in the face of uh, bringing the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact to fruition here in Wisconsin. Senator Kelda Royce and Senator Melissa Agard are with us tonight. Um, Senator Kelda Hel Helen Royce is an attorney, a small business owner, and former nonprofit executive. She represents Wisconsin's 26th Senate District, which includes most of Madison and Shorewood Hills. Senator Royce received her BA from New York University and her JD from the University of Wisconsin Law School, where she worked on the Innocence Project. After spending four years as executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, she was elected to the state assembly and served as Democratic, Democratic caucus chair in her second term. She also practiced law at Wheeler, Van Sickle and Anderson. Senator Melissa Agard represents Wisconsin's 16th Senate District. She was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, and is a proud graduate of East High School and the University of Wisconsin, Madison. She was first elected to represent the 46th, or excuse me, the 48th District in November of 2012, and is currently serving her fifth term in the Wisconsin State Legislature. The 16th Senate District encompasses the parts of Eastern Dane County, including Sun Prairie, Cottage Grove, McFarland, Stoughton, Monona, Fitchburg, and parts of Madison's North, East, and Southeast side. With that, I will turn it over now to the senators to give us all a bit more information about the bill, its history, and what the legislature needs us to do to help them get it passed. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, Senator Agard and I are obviously very passionate along with many of our colleagues here in Wisconsin. And um, this is something that we have been working on for a long time. In fact, the National Popular Vote Bill was one of the first bills that I introduced when I was first elected to the State Assembly in 2009. Uh, and at that time, um, it was really not as partisan as it has become. Uh, it was, there were a number of Republicans who initially had signed on to the bill. And then uh, several months later, the, a word came down from their leadership that had come from Republicans nationally. Absolutely not. We have to um, crush this thing because they were worried that it would guarantee um, that Republicans would never win the presidency again. And um, and so from, from that time forward, basically, we've had a very difficult time getting Republican legislators to sign on to this bill, uh, even though many of them, I think, 
privately agree that the Electoral College is anti-democratic. Uh, now, I will say I, I took a break. So I served in the assembly for four years and then I was gone for eight years. And during that time, um, Senator Agard served. Um, and so this banner has been carried for a long time. And, and I think uh, now that we see states like Texas starting to turn and be a swing state, um, I, I think that uh, nationally Republicans realize that they can actually compete, that higher turnout doesn't necessarily benefit Democratic uh, candidates, and that they can run and win in places um, where there's high turnout and in places that are usually thought of as, as democratic. And the minute that that Texas really seems like it's not gonna be firmly in the red camp, then I think we're gonna see a sea change. And, um, and the national Republicans will realize, well, we had better get on board with this because it will be our only chance if Texas goes blue to um, have a chance of electing the president. So Kelda, thank you very much for um, kicking us off. Uh, after Kelda left the assembly for a time, that's when I entered into the assembly. And um, we have seen over the years, this bill be introduced many times, many legislative cycles. And the number of Democrats that have signed on to the bill in support of it have has increased. Um, every legislative cycle. Um, but we still are not at the point even where all Democrats in the legislature have signed on in support of this piece of legislation. So I do think it's really important that we focus on the fact that we need to be talking to all legislators. Don't make an assumption um, just because someone's a Democrat or someone's a Republican that they are in support or opposition of this policy. We need to make sure that we're reaching out and educating um, all of our elected officials about the importance of supporting the popular vote. Um, we also, and Kelda, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I don't believe that this bill has ever even received a committee hearing since it's been introduced in the legislature in Wisconsin. Um, and that makes it really hard for it to be able to move forward. Is that your recollection as well? Yes, it is. So without those com committee hearings, um, there's no possibility for it to move to the floor for the full legislature to even have a vote on it. Um, why is it that the majority party, Republican-led legislature in Wisconsin, um, is so afraid from ha about having a public discussion about um, honoring the votes, the popular vote, and the votes of the people of the state of Wisconsin, when in fact, even on the ceiling of the governor's conference room is inscribed the will of the people is the law of the land. I can't think of a better example of legislation that really honors something that is enshrined in our Capitol building um, and in um, really the fabric and the fiber of the state of Wisconsin. Um, so when it comes to how it is that we move this bill forward, it is important that people do reach out um, to their legislators and share with them why this is important um, for democracy, not only in Wisconsin, but nationwide. Um, and there are so many resources, um, as were discussed earlier, and you're going to have access to um, later, uh, that are at your hand. You don't need to be an attorney. You don't need to be the most studied person on the popular vote, sharing your story um, about the importance of protecting our elections and protecting our democracy um, and using the bullet points and the toolkits that are provided for you will make a difference when it comes to um, uh, influencing the policy making that is happening in the state capitol building. I'll pass it back to Kelda for a bit. Yeah, I think that Wisconsin, there are two main structural challenges to our ability to pass the national popular vote interstate compact. Um, the first is that we're a swing state. And so we're one of the few states that actually does benefit under the current system in that we get a lot of attention. Um, we get, you know, presidential visits and high, uh, you know, high level surrogates. We get a lot of money. Uh, our TV stations get a huge amount of money. Um, and all the things that sort of come with a swing state, I mean, we get catered to in terms of federal policy. Uh, so uh, I think that some legislators, and I've heard this from both Democrats and Republicans, are reluctant to give up that special status um, because it's really fun to have candidates, you know, come and do huge rallies and, you know, get to get your, your picture of your selfie with Barack Obama behind you um, or Donald Trump, if that's your thing. And um, so, and there is a real economic impact, of course, to that as well. 
Um, now I would make the counter argument that it also makes it much more expensive for all of us. It's really hard for a legislative candidate, um, you know, even in a top tier competitive Senate race to buy media and get earned press attention when there's so much uh, money coming into the state from national level races. Uh, so it makes it makes everything more expensive. Of course, you know, TV and radio spots become much more expensive and it just makes it much harder to kind of break through with your message. So I don't think that it's necessarily a net positive to be a swing state, even um, from a politician's perspective. The second structural barrier that we face is that we're a heavily gerrymandered state. And, you know, one of the problems with gerrymandering is that it really breaks the it breaks the accountability between the voter and the elected official and when there is when you just don't have to be responsive and explain yourself and justify yourself in a meaningful way to voters anymore there's really no incentive to compromise if you know what the outcome is going to be of a legislative election um, or you know who's going to control the chamber and the state then you really don't have to give any credence to the other side's ideas. So they Republicans in Wisconsin only have to do the things that they're interested in doing, and there's no way for us to force them. And I think you know this is true in Democratic gerrymandered states as well. Um, you know the Democrats don't have to give Republicans the time of day, and they set the agenda, and that's that. Um, and so a proposal like the National Popular Vote that um, because it touches on politics and you know the very consequential idea of who might win an election and, and specifically the presidency, uh, you know, there's every reason to not touch it. And um, all the sort of countervailing forces of logic and rational thought, and this is how we run every other election in the world. <laughs> the person who gets the most votes wins. Like this is a very normal thing to do. Um, but yet when you're um, looking through this distorted lens of gerrymandering, uh, it becomes something that is is very very difficult. Um, so, uh, I think so. That's that uh, aside. Those are some real challenges that we face here in Wisconsin. Um, it is really important that we know that there is power in um, each of our actions and that the pendulum does swing. Um, so. Um, despite the fact that we are very gerrymandered, um, despite the fact that the Republican majority holds the control over what bills have public hearings, um, there have been great movements made um, from people who have put their um, shoe leather to the ground um, and spent time reaching out to their policymakers, even here in Wisconsin over the last decade. Um, I guess it's more like 12 years now. Uh, have to add add years to how long it's been so challenging here in our state um, and make this a priority uh, for the people who are serving in the Capitol building. And this year is an important year for us to be doing that. I think now more than ever, people are understanding the importance of fair, free, and safe elections. Um, people are understanding the importance of um, uh, good transition of transitions of power. Um, people are understanding the importance of votes. Uh, we've recently had, even in our spring elections here in Wisconsin, I believe there were six elections that were um, tied or within one vote of each other. So every vote, every action that we take absolutely does make a difference. Um, and you never know when you are the one that's gonna throw that pebble in the pond and those ripples are actually gonna take and we're gonna receive that tidal wave. So here in Wisconsin, um, we have a history of um, civil action, of standing up and being leaders um, in creating these movements. And certainly there are states um, that are ahead of us when it comes to influencing the national popular vote policymaking. Um, but because we are a purple state, we tend to be pretty pragmatic. Yes, it's true. There are some really loud rhetorical people um, on the extremes. And it seems like there's a lot more of them than there are, um, but frankly, it's because they are so loud. Um, they, they are um, a, a real minority. And having conversations, listening to people um, and helping them understand the importance of the popular vote um, and how it is that uh, making sure that the national popular vote moves forward is actually part of 
fair, free, and safe elections in Wisconsin and in our nation, and in the best interest of democracy, as more and more people are understanding the importance of each of our roles in democracy, right? We're not watching democracy happen. We're actually part of helping democracy happen. So making this be an issue right now, as we have elections going on, asking people who are running for office where they stand on this, what position they're willing to take, how hard they're willing to work, is one really important step. And after the elections, also continuing to hold those people accountable to the positions they took um, when they were on the campaign trail. Because oftentimes there are people um, who say one thing, um, and then after they're elected, they take a totally different action. Um, so it is very, very important um, that we continue holding people accountable to the positions that they take. Um, and I do see a, a question in uh, the chat from Barbara saying, uh, we've heard that many legislators don't read their emails. What do you think is the best way to reach out to our legislators to discuss um, the national popular vote? Well, I'll tell you, even with my amazing staff, I still read my emails. I mean, I have, it's it's a it's an illness for me. I have this iPhone that has my uh, state email on it and I will, I read through them. Um, I know that every office is set up very differently and maybe there are some offices that um, the legislators are not reading those emails, but in our, in my office, and I think this is the same thing for Kelda, we meet people where they're at. If people send an email, we're gonna read that. If they send a letter with a stamp on it, we open that and we read that. People make phone calls, um, we log those and those get reported back to us. Um, I get messages from people via text message and Facebook and you know through Instagram and Twitter. I prefer not to have those because it does make things a little bit messier for tracking through the office. Um, but I think another thing to remember is many legislators have office hours within their districts um, and take time and attend those office hours where people are out in their districts, whether it's at a library or a park, um, a school, a community center, um, make yourself seen and heard because not only will you be holding the elected official accountable in a public manner, um, but you're gonna be able to educate the other people that are participating in those um, office hours. So while I can't answer Barbara exactly what all 132 legislators do in the Capitol building, um, and if they are actually reading their own emails, um, I'm pretty sure that both Kelda and I are on the side of uh, reading those emails um, and um, crafting our responses to folks in a thoughtful way. Um, but I really, um, I, will, I really wanna add my explanation point to what it was that I was talking about in that the more we talk about this and educate people on what actually the popular vote is, you'd be amazed at how many people that don't know what the electoral college is. People just assume we have a national popular vote in the United States. They don't realize what the electoral college is and what damages it is causing. Um, so helping people understand that what they think is happening isn't happening and what is actually happening needs to change. Um, that will really help us in the legislature because the pendulum does swing and we will get to the point um, where our Republican colleagues are gonna understand this more and more, um, especially when their colleagues down in Texas um, are scratching their heads and wondering how this happened. Yeah, I would just um, echo what Senator Agard said. The, the best thing to do is contact your legislator early and often. Um, there are a lot of issues out there that are demanding our attention. And so keeping national popular vote top of mind is really the goal. If you can swing it, the best thing to do is a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, if you can get a group of constituents um, or one or two people who, uh, you know, along with maybe an advocate uh, who's well-versed in the issue to come with you. Um, and I know that National Popular Vote is always willing to uh, send their incredible advocacy teams. I see um, my colleague, former Senator Rebecca Warren on the call, you know, they will, they will prep you, they will come with you. Uh, and, and help you do the heavy lifting if you can get in-person meetings, that's the best. Um, because uh, something like this, uh, people wanna make it needlessly complicated, right? They wanna say, oh, you know, this is unconstitutional. It undoes the electoral college. Um, you know, this is too difficult for me to understand. This is gonna have a negative impact. I mean, you, people just have so many objections and it takes a little time to sort of unpack what this, what this does, how it works and answer people's um, legitimate questions about um, how this works because people just are really not very familiar with the electoral college or with interstate compacts. So um, I think 
you know, that's, that's really the best thing to do. And I always say, even if you can get a meeting with staff, often staff are, uh, and it's different in every office, but staff uh, can be just as good or even better than the legislator, because, you know, oftentimes when you're meeting with a legislature, legislator, they might just be performing interest, right? And I know this because I used to be an advocate and I would go meet with legislators and they'd be like, yep, yeah, uh-huh, great. Um, but it's really the staff who are driving um, what issues get talked about in the newsletter and they're advising the legislator on what to do with respect to certain pieces of legislation. Um, and staff have more time and, and they're interested. You know, there's a reason that they're legislative staffers it's because they care about politics and policy. So try to engage that staffer and, um, you know, and ask them uh, what they think, you know, what do they think of it that we've had two near misses and two wrong winner elections out of the last six presidential elections? And, and try to get them get them talking. And um, you know, the more that you can listen, the more information that you have to provide follow-up information or to respond to and really get at what the what the challenges are. So I think um, just in summary, it's really important for you all to realize that you are the experts, as Kelda said. Um, here's my analogy. Uh, it's like having a sheet cake, right? Like we are the frosting on the cake as the legislators. We see that surface. You guys are the experts. You're cutting all the way down. You have, um, you have that experience. You have the knowledge. You have your toolkits. You have your stories. So bring that in um, and help educate and provide more um, substance to what it is um, that we know and what our staff knows in the building. Um, meet with your legislators, whether it's in the Capitol building, at listening sessions, um, know that staff is an extension of us, um, and realize that you are the bosses. The people of the state of Wisconsin are the bosses of us as the, legislat as the legislature, um, and it is our job to earnestly hear you um, and um, take what it is that we're hearing from the people and influence the policy. If you have a policymaker or a legislator who is not responsive, who won't listen to you, doesn't have listening sessions, is not making themselves available, heck, maybe you want to consider running for office so that you can be one of the people that is influencing whether or not Wisconsin moves forward with the national popular vote. I really appreciate the fact that you guys um, invited me to be here with you tonight um, and look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you both, Senator Agard and Senator Royce, for your time this evening, for your valuable advice to all of us. And um, we're going to spend the rest of the meeting now figuring out how we can put our boots on the ground and, and get this job done. I see that some people are putting some questions in the chat. Please continue to do that. We will have time for some Q&A as we get um, further deep into the program. Um, but now let me turn our attention to uh, my introduction of the League of Women Voters state president, Dorothy Skye. Uh, Dorothy resides in Rhinelander. She's a retired OBGYN surgeon. Dorothy's been working with Barbara and our other committee members for years, and she is here tonight to show us all the toolkit that we've been referencing. And um, we've developed this toolkit, we've got other actions in play, and this is what's going to take Wisconsin over the finish line. Dorothy? We've reviewed some of the important facts about the national popular vote and the national popular vote interstate compact. And I think everybody's heard again and again, the importance of reaching out to our legislators and reaching out to educate our fellow citizens and bring them along with us to build the support underneath this important reform to our election, election system. And there are two nifty, easy to reach toolkits. They're depicted on this slide. This is the, uh, a snapshot from the State League website. You go to the home page in the banner on the left, you scroll down and see the uh, toolkits and resources domain. And Molly's got a pretty pink arrow on that. If you click on that, then it takes you to the screen on the right. And in there, you've got all the resources that you need. 
uh, fact sheets, sample letters to the editor, letter, letters to uh, educators, frequently asked questions, um, the complete kit. And another excellent resource is nationalpopularvote.org. This is a, a national nonprofit. I'm gonna introduce interrupt for one second. It's com, nationalpopularvote.com. Ah, uh, absolutely. Yep. Nationalpopularvote.com. But if, if you just uh, type national popular vote into your browser, the uh, right website will come up. And uh, as you can see, again, the pink arrows in this slide, they have templates and um, pathways for notifying, for uh, uh, sending communications to your legislators or letters to the editor. And by all means, knock on doors, uh, inform your neighbors and inform your friends and meet with legislators in person at every opportunity. Thank you, Dorothy. And I, I do ask that all of you avail yourself of these resources um, there are opportunities for you to learn more, um, perhaps even learn enough to feel comfortable giving a presentation in your local community, but certainly to have enough tool in your toolbox that you can march yourself down to the Capitol or make that telephone call to your legislator, as we heard the senators say is so important, and make sure that we're um, making our voices heard to those who represent us. Um, I'm always filled with such a um, great amount of hope when I hear that it's pretty easy to affect this change. We just got to do some work. Um, and we have to know that if individually we do a little work, when we all are doing it together, the collective good that we can do in this space is going to get this legislation passed. We can't ignore that the collaborative effort reaps a much bigger outcome. So now I think it's a little time. We've learned a lot. We've listened a lot tonight. Um, we should have a little fun. Um, Molly Carmichael, who is the State League's communications manager, she's queued up a little test for how well we've been paying attention tonight. Um, Molly is a graduate of the UW Madison School of Journalism and Political Science. She joined the league almost a year ago, and she's been adding value every single day. Um, and Molly's got a little quiz for us. Well, thanks for the intro, Deb. Um, and also just before we get into the quiz, I wanna point out that the toolkit and the correct national popular vote website are linked in the chat. And again, we'll send out everything in an email. So don't worry about making sure you bookmark everything and um, jot everything down. Yeah, so we're gonna do a little true false quiz, a few questions before we take questions from our speakers at the end and feel free to either think to yourself or put a true or false in the chat. All right, question one. Currently, the candidate who gets the most votes in the nation, the national popular vote, wins the US presidency. T or F, true or false? All right, yep, false. So the candidate who wins 270 or more electoral votes, the majority is elected president. And this is irrespective of whether he or she wins the national popular vote. So good job, everyone. All right, number two. In the 2016 election, Wisconsin voters casted 1.4 million votes for Trump and 1.38 million votes for Clinton. So Wisconsin's 10 electoral votes were divided six for Donald Trump and four for Hillary Clinton. True or false? <clears throat> All 
All right, again, it looks like you guys are good. This is false. So Wisconsin, like 47 other states, has what's called a winner takes all allocation of electoral votes. So this means that whoever wins the presidential race in Wisconsin gets um, all 10 of Wisconsin electors, no matter how many people actually voted for each candidate. All right, question number three. Wyoming has one elector for every 189, five, 100 people, while well, California has one for every 697,000 people. Sorry, I don't usually read numbers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm seeing some, some trues in the chat. All right, and this one is true, which is super bananas. Um, each state has two electoral votes representing two senators, plus an electoral vote for each congressional representative. The electoral formula specified in the Constitution and the Reappointment Act of 1929 froze the number of congressional representatives and hence electors. And this disadvantages states as they grow. Um, all right, awesome. Next question. Four, currently whoever gets 270 or more electoral votes wins the US presidency. True or false? Got some trues. This is a classic. And it is true. Good job, everyone. Um, number five, the constitution Mandates how the states direct their electors to vote for president and vice president. True or false? <clears throat> I'm seeing a mix here, mostly false. All right, false. Um, so all the constitution says is each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. So a really irritatingly written sentence, but good job. Um, so it looks like we're running out of time. We only have 10 minutes left. So we're actually going to jump to Q&A, but thank you all for participating. Thank you. I'll start with a couple of questions that are already in the chat, but please feel free to add additional questions and otherwise raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question yourself. A question from the chat is, um, why is Texas leaning toward the national popular vote? I should clarify, I don't, I don't know that Texas, I'm not sure where they are in their process. Um, I just mean that you know, if you look at the national picture, there are some really reliable red states and Texas is the biggest. Um, and then there are some really reliable big blue states like California and New York and Illinois um, and Maryland, you know, states that have a lot of electoral votes. But the minute that Texas, um, which has been trending more democratic and is becoming, it's kind of moving into swing territory, the minute that Texas flips and really becomes a true swing state, then I think you'll see Republicans who have opposed the national popular vote start to jump on board because they realize if um, you know if Texas goes blue, then they're not going to have a chance under the current, you know, winner take all system that we have. This kind of broken electoral college state by state um, method of allocating um, electoral college votes. So I think I think that's you know Texas is changing politics or what is going to spur Republicans to really reconsider. Thank you, Senator Royce. Um, the next question is, um, uh, in your humble opinion, um, what do you think the other legislators actually know about interstate compacts? And what do you think they think of them? I, I think they know very little. Um, I, you know, I, I'm an attorney and um, I didn't know very much about them either. Um, and I've, I've learned a lot about them through the process of, uh, you know, becoming an advocate for and an author of the National Popular Vote Bill here. Um, it's just not something that comes up a lot. And 
Um, and it isn't something that, you know, you're generally taught in any kind of a government class. It's really three branches of government and, you know, maybe the basics. Um, so it's pretty obscure. Most legislators um, are not actually experts in policy. Most are not lawyers anymore. Um, and so people, you know, really come to the table, some of them knowing virtually nothing about government. Uh, and so you just, you really have to start with the assumption that, that people don't really know anything. And, you know, even worse, a lot of them have uh, really misinformed understandings of uh, what the law is, how government operates, what the electoral college is, and, you know, historically why it was put into place. There are all these myths about, you know, how the electoral college was this really noble way, um, you know, to elect the president so that we wouldn't end up with a demagogue, when in fact, it was one of the key concessions to slaveholding interests. Um, and it continues to this day to have, you know, racist effects and to devalue the votes of people of color. So, um, you know, really understanding um, the founders, the constitution, um, and, and as well as the mechanisms of interstate compacts, which is a pretty obscure part of the constitution, I think um, is, is a big challenge for state legislators because they just don't have occasion to do it. And very few have a background in it. I think to add on to that, even at a more um, basic level, uh, we have thousands of bills that are introduced uh, to the legislature any given legislative cycle. Um, less than half of those bills even get assigned for committee hearings. Um, we, as legislators, are assigned to serve on certain committees. So if a bill is assigned to a committee that we sit on and it gets scheduled for a public hearing, you as a legislator are more likely to dig in to the content of that bill um, and understanding um, the different sides, the different opinions, the, uh, the pros and the cons of that legislation in order to prepare for the public hearing. Um, so Kelda serves on different committees than I do. She's gonna be um, an expert on the bills that go to her committees that actually get public hearings more so than I will. And I'll be more of an expert on the bills that get scheduled for public hearings on the committees that I serve on. But that means that of the bills that don't get scheduled for public hearings, which quite frankly in Wisconsin is primarily bills authored by Democrats like this bill, um, very few legislators will take the time to actually dive in or even read more than a paragraph summary on what we call a co-sponsorship memo that um, includes a bill when it is circulated for consideration um, in the Capitol building. So I think it's really important to um, really assume that the legislator probably doesn't know near as much as you do. Um, going back to my analogy, uh, we know just the surface, just the top level, make that assumption. Uh, we don't know all the ins and outs all the way down. And we depend on citizens, um, passionate citizens, um, our friends and neighbors like you, um, and also organizations like League of Women's Voters um, and the National Popular Vote Groups um, in situations like this to have uh, really the depth of the knowledge uh, in order to help that policy move forward. So if you do have the opportunity to meet with your legislator, um, don't feel like they know more than you. Um, you are the expert. You actually hold that power um, and use that time wisely, share your personal passions, um, and then leave the leave behind. Um, because we can always read that leave behind at another time, but it's that personal story. Um, why it is that this matters to you, either plus or minus, but in this case, plus, um, when it comes to national popular vote, those are the stories that resonate with policymakers on both sides of the aisle. Thank you. Um, one, um, I think we have time for one or two more quick questions. Um, one is that, you know, uh, the league, for instance, in our work on redistricting had, um, we ran campaigns around the state to stand up resolutions that got passed at the local level. Do you think that um, legislators pay attention to these non-binding resolutions and should we work in that direction? Even I think some legislators do, but more importantly, press does. And it it builds information among voters about 
the issue. I think one of the reasons that gerrymandering became um, such a central topic for voters in Wisconsin is that almost everyone in our state has had an opportunity to vote on a referendum about how we should draw maps in the state. So it's a really important educational tool. Not everything has to change a legislator's mind to be worth doing. Um, and I, I think that um, it's a big, big undertaking and you don't want to do it on an issue like this unless you're really confident that you're going to have the resources to win um, because, you know, it could backfire if um, there turns out to be well-funded opposition and, and people are confused about the effort, right? This is not something that, um, you know, people are as familiar with versus like abortion rights where people have a very clear idea of what their position is on it. So um, that would be my, my only caution on that. And we do know in Wisconsin, um, the vast majority of the counties have taken up um, non-binding referendum questions in regards to gerrymandering, um, but we still haven't been able to cross that finish line and address gerrymandering in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so it, I think it is, it is important. The press does pay attention. Um, it does build the base. It helps move the conversation, but it doesn't mean that we're gonna cross the finish line necessarily. Thank you, Senator Eckgard, and thank you, Senator Royce, for your participation in this uh, important conversation tonight. Uh, thank all of you for participating also in this webinar. Um, if you have not participated in all of the National Popular Vote webinars in this series, you can find them all on our website at lwvwi.org. Wisconsin we know we can get the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact passed. Now, we need to work together to get it done. Thank you for your time. Thanks, everyone.